Hi, my name is Beth Jahaski. Hello, my name is Ed Clements. And, and this, this is, is Hey Bay, Bay City. City. That was perfect, guys. Excellently done. Before we start talking about work, though, I, I want to talk about each, each one of you. So, Beth, who are you? What do you do? How did you get into this position? I am the work-based learning coordinator over at Western High School. This is, I believe, my fifth year in this role. Prior to that, I was classroom teacher for 15 years, mostly at Western. I did spend a few years at some other Bay City public schools. Mm. What, what, did, what did you teach at Western in the classroom? Yeah, I taught business, communication, accounting, lots of technology courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How'd you get into the, the, the work-based work niche? Well, Ed was filling, which, can I talk about Ed yet? Yeah, you can okay. talk about Ed. <laughs> Ed was filling. Lemons, the surprise <laughs> guest of the day. He's, he's our surprise. <laughs> Ed was filling the the sole role of work based learning coordinator for the district, and it became too much. Where we had so many students interested in the program, we really needed one for each school. And I was blessed to be offered the position. I'll be honest, I loved classroom teaching so much. I mm. was very hesitant at first. I love this just. I love it equally as much. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that has to be a little bit scary because you've, you've found your home, you found your niche, you found something that you love, and now, hey, do you want to do something different? That's got to be a little bit scary to leave that, that safety net of, hey, yeah. I found my groove. And I think the, the thing I was the most scared for was that I was going to lose connection with the students. Mm. So I was worried that I wasn't going to have that strong connection with students. And the cool thing is I've just found different ways to create those connections. So. Mm. Mm, very cool. So, Ed, you were f you were flying solo originally. Yes, that's correct. Ed Clements, and I'm at Central High School's work-based learning coordinator. I started this role in 2011, and it was uh, one person for both high schools. So I went one day at Western, one day at Central, and then back and forth each day. And I started with the schools in the year 2000, and when the first day I started, I seen these positions, and I thought, that's what I want to do someday. Because there was two Two at Western, two at Central, because we had a much larger student population 22 years ago. And as people retired and the student population dropped, they didn't replace people. And it got to 2010 when the coordinator at Central retired. The person at Western was at that point where she could retire. She did it for one year and retired, and then I got it. And so I was the person from 2011 until 2017 at both schools. And then in 2017, when the program had grown and <clears throat> they said, we have to have two people. So I then went to Central because I'm, I'm a Bay City guy. I've always kind of been from the city and working at Central in that split role. I'd never worked at Central before, and I just really fell in love with, with Bay City Central. And so it was a pretty easy choice for me to, to choose to go full time at Central. And then Beth and I had worked together for... Yeah. Probably, what year did you get hired? Oh two, oh three, oh two. Oh two. So Beth and I had worked together for close to twenty years, fifteen, twenty years when she got hired. So it it works out. So before we start talking about what exactly work based learning is, it seems as a former teacher that work based learning is it's kind of a a, a newer trend in education, a, a modern trend. Well, s schools are starting to veer, but here in B Bay County, it's been around for a while. Is that right? Yeah, we've had, Bay City Schools has had a program since 1944. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah, where it was called co-op. Beth and I aren't really creating anything new. We're just carrying the torch from a lot of people that came before us that built this program. We still have former coordinators that are involved in the program, one being Marty Gottesman's kind of the, he's the, the on the Mount Rushmore, what would yes. you say? The father yes, of Bay County. Just, we're, just we're an amazing here. man with amazing energy that, a passion you know, re is a reti retired from the school district as assistant superintendent and is still, you know, involved. He calls me almost once a week with about just to talk about work based wow. learning. Wow. I mean, I mean, that, that says so much about the community and the educational system, because because this is kind of a, a, a quote looked at as a new thing in education. How do we get kids in the workforce? But here here we are having done it for decades. It's very, very cool. Pretty cool. It's just evolved is all work based learning, I think, now covers more areas, more ideas than, than it, it probably did in the past, but really they were there. They just weren't, they didn't have a name yet. <laughs> yeah. 
maybe before we get too far into the weeds, we should define exactly what work-based yeah. learning is. Because if, if you don't have children in the Bay City public school system or even a, a child within work-based learning, you might be thinking, ah, I kind of know what that is, but I don't yeah. quite know. So, Beth, go ahead. Give me a 101 on what, what is work-based learning. All right. I'm going to try my best. So work-based learning, if, if anyone has ever heard of the work-based learning continuum, it's not necessarily just co-op students. A lot of people think of co-op students and, and now they think that's work-based learning where it covers so much more. It covers um, basically any interaction with the community and the businesses with the students. So it could start with as early as awareness and maybe that is um, a guest speaker in the classroom telling a little bit about their company and telling a little bit about they, what they do. It could be a field trip. So that is kind of we're going to help students become aware of something that maybe they weren't aware of before. And then there is exploration where they might be able to dig a little bit deeper. So that's like job shadows. We just did an awesome job shadow day with the Rotary Club of Bay City. And then kids get to kind of, you know, what I really want to learn more about this particular industry or this particular career. What Ed and I deal with a lot is actually like the training and preparation area of the wheel. I call it a wheel, the continuum. Uh, and that's where we have sustained relationships with companies. The students are working with those companies for the mostly for the whole school year, and they get experience in that industry. So there's so many different areas, facets of work-based learning at. I don't know if I missed no, any. You, you hit it pretty good. And it's and the, the sole focus really 10 years ago to 15 years ago was just job placements, finding seniors a place to work during their senior year and they'd have half a day of school and then half the day to go to work. And it has changed over the last 10, 15 years to more of a nine through 12 program where Mm -hmm. you are doing a lot of the foundation work as ninth and 10th graders, the career awareness, and then building on experiences to build a resume. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're working with a lot more ninth and 10th graders to get them ready to that point during their junior year and predominantly seniors. We, the, the kids that are out on work placements are mostly seniors. We do get a few juniors here and there. It is difficult, more difficult for a junior because of the schedule requirements for graduation in the Michigan Merit curriculum. But you know, Beth really described it really well, going from awareness to getting ready mm-hmm. to doing. I, I, I love the idea <clears throat> of, of increasing awareness because thinking back to my experience in, in high school, I, w- I wasn't really aware of, of what my no. options were. Like, uh, of course, you, ha- you have the internet and you have your individual passions and th- things that you like or, or whatever. But, but as far as of having a, a, like a real picture of what I could do and wh- where I could go and, wh- okay, I like this, but how can it apply here? And then also having the opportunities to actually experience yeah. those things as opposed to just kind of guessing. Like, I guess I'm, I like graphic arts, I don't go do that. I, I love this awareness combined with actually presenting kids an opportunity to experience this, to figure it out. That is one of the things I love the most. And, and I'm not a certified counselor, but I love to help kids with career questions and, and avenues and you can try. And even saying to a student, they might say, I love my math classes, but you know, I'm not sure that I want to do a job that that, had, that is all math. And then, well, look at all of these other opportunities. What if you did a job shadow? What if you did a virtual interview with one of these people and you ask questions? And even Ed and I see it a lot where a student, they are 100% sure they know what they want to do. And then we give them some sort of experience, even if it, it might not be a placement, but it might be a job shadow. And they come back and they say, oh, no, that's not for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's actually, to be honest with you, that's one of my favorite parts of the yeah. job. Is when a student finds out, like, ooh, I don't want to do that, or I don't really yeah, like why that. Why do you say that, that it's your favorite part of the job? Because it's a lot better to find that out when you're mm-hmm. 16 and 17 than when you're like me and found out when I was like 24. Mm-hmm. All the time and money that yeah. you put into something and then to find out, like, ooh, this isn't really what I want to do Yeah, that it's 16 years old. Yeah, we, we, we talk so much about work-based learning being important from the educational perspective, but I think just as important, the practical perspective of 
saving yourself a decade of your life or $100,000. I thought I wanted to be a nurse and then I became a nurse and I'm like, oh, this is not at all, right. all what I thought. And so even just from a practical perspective, hey, get a little bit of a taste of what, where you think you're going to go so that you can for sure know either A, yes, this is absolutely what I want to do or B, like you said, Ed, I just saved myself a decade plus more or in money and all of these things because I actually got to get a taste of what I thought I wanted. Or the other side of that is we get a lot of students that they want to go into medical. We struggle to find medical placements because of all the HIPAA laws. Yeah, yeah. And, a, and yeah, a lot yeah, of places yeah. require students to be 18. And we don't have very many students that are 18. Mm. And you find somebody, okay, hey, the only thing I really have is a job at a bank. And okay, I'll, I'll take it because I want to work. I want to earn some money during high school. And they fall in love with it, and they're still, they're still working there <laughs> yep. like 10 years later. Yeah, it's, that's cool, too. It's a win for everybody. <clears throat> so tell me, how exactly does this work? If I am a student interested in work-based learning, how do I go becoming part of it? And then kind of walk me through what, what my options are or what my, di my school day might look like. Kind of walk me through that. Give me a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, to get involved is, is really easy. A student just has to, whether... Just make contact with Beth or I, whether it's an email, phone call, text message, stop down to the office. And now, like we talked about earlier, we're, we're more involved in, in 9th and 10th and 11th that the students are, are becoming, they, they know us, so they're comfortable just walking into our office. Where when I started, we really did a push like in January of students' junior years. I was going into classrooms, beating the hallways looking for applicants. We still do that, but not as much as we, because the kids now know us and they come to us and, and we're able to send emails to all the families, parents to let them know that this is coming up. So all they really have to do is make a contact with us and we have a very simple application, um, gets their demographic information and then their interest. And then we start getting positions like in February. Mm -hmm. We have companies year in and year out that are with us. And then when we get the positions, then we've built a list of interested students and we just start calling them down and saying, These, this is what I got. What would you like to apply for? And the other side of that too, is we get students with specific interests that maybe we don't have something that comes in year in and year out. So then Beth and I will go search that out and try mm -hmm. to find that specific placement that a student's looking for. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is, is there's more students than ever that are already working. Kids are finding jobs in 10th and 11th grade more than, than ever. And so a kid comes in and says, hey, I work here. Can I use that for work-based learning? And 99 out of 100 times, they can't. And I'm also finding where they've already got a job and they've been there for a year and they, they don't want to leave. And, and we have other, I'll offer other opportunities and they're turning them down because they really like where they work. And, mm -hmm. and some of our students are, are doing, a good they're, job. yeah, they're, they, yeah. they do a good job, but they're also making, you know, pretty good money. I mean, I've got students that walk in the office saying I'm making 1250, I'm making 14. And that was unheard of four or five years ago. Yeah. So. Right. right. Did he cover all those bases, Beth? He did a pretty good job. Good. I was going to say, like, with some of those students that come in with their own job, the cool thing is, is so they have been there, but then sometimes, like, for instance, I might have a student that works at McDonald's, and I will say, do not, most employers will say, if I see fast food on a resume, I will take that student in a heartbeat because they realize everything that that student has been exposed to. How often does someone come in and say that cheeseburger was delicious at McDonald's, right? But I'll have students that maybe because they're in it their second year, they've been working there a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, they might be transitioning to the manager role. So they're in leadership roles, and these are seniors in high school, which is pretty cool. Growing up, I always kind of, and, and, the, and I feel guilty of it, you kind of snickered at the Oh, you work at McDonald's or I'll tell you what, since having this role, the fast food industry is amazing. What, what they do, the management and how they, they take kids with zero experience and skills and they really lift them up. And, and Beth said, when we have an employer like say Dow Chemical SC Johnson, they see fast food experience on a resume. It's like, a slam dunk. They want that kid yeah. because they are the experience <laughs> that students get in the fast food industry is amazing with the customer service, 
you know, problem solving, thinking on their feet. It's fast paced. It, it, teamwork. It, it, They're teamwork. learning how to dif- mm-hmm. deal with difficult people. Yes. There's so many. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Skill yeah. Sets. Yeah. The, this the snicker came because, unfortunately, fast food positions like they kind of look down on. Mm-hmm. Especially if I'm a if I'm a high school. I, I don't want to flip cheeseburgers. I don't want to do this. But it's so fascinating to me to hear from you, you guys, bringing what actual employers feel. Like, no, if I see that fast food experience, they shoot to the top of my list. And like, you, you don't necessarily think that way if you're just looking from the employee side. Well, it's just McDonald's or it's just fast food. But like both of you have said, I mean, that is the the testing ground for so much can you work with a team can you work under pressure can you communicate can when the fryer goes down can you work through that problem are you willing to do good work that maybe you're not thrilled about a hundred percent of the time do you have that capacity i mean it just is such a great opportunity to experience all of these different things these kind of and learn and and improve these soft skills of being an employee which honestly should be considered the hard skills of being an employee. Can you work with a team? Can you communicate? Things like we that. We call those essential skills. Oh, beautiful. So, I'm going to steal that. Essential yeah, skills. Essential skills. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 love, I love reframing it as essential skills because the pervasive language is, well, you have hard skills, very specific to the, your, your role. Soft skills kind of conveys them, maybe not not as quite important, but I think about so my, much more. Yes, yeah, I think about my own life. Used to be a teacher, then guitar builder, then started my own business. I mean, the essential skills are the things that have been consistent, even though ten years ago I was teaching fifth and sixth grade, and now I'm doing something completely different. So, tell me a little bit about. So, we've talked about job shadowing. We've talked about kind of uh, a little bit about on-site experience. Any other ways that kids really get get to learn from work environments? Is there interview practice, internships? Tell me a little yep. bit about that. Yeah, we do practice interviews at the high school, and we I think, Beth, you just had them at yeah, Western. Yeah, we just had ours. Cool. And we have ours coming up at, at Central where we take, we have, the school district has really the last few years made a, a focus on career development, mm-hmm. the essential skills where we have two required courses. There's a required course they have to take as sophomores, and then there's a required course they have to take as seniors that are career development specific. So we target that sophomore class coming up for our um, practice interviews where we have people from all over the community come in and uh, help students with the practice interview. They'll hopefully get two or three in one day, and then they they get uh, their feedback on things that they did well things that they need to improve on. That's one of the ways we do it. We, Like I said, we have the career development courses where they're going from ground level of the awareness to building a resume, practicing interview skills, cover letters, thank you letters. And we also have a program that we use called Big Interview. It's like a, an online virtual interviewing preparation program oh, cool. that we've been using for three or four years. And, and it, it's really made a difference when you, you show students, you know, how to log in, how to create an account, and then use it to get ready. I've heard so much feedback where students have told me, yeah, that was a difference maker. And in going to an interview, I, I felt like I was ready. So mm, I, I, I love specifically that interview practice, the resume assistance, because we, we, we kind of have kids go through school and then we throw them out into the real world and say, hey, by the way, your entire professional life is hinging on these two things. and Meanwhile, a lot of times we haven't really given them the tools to be able to navigate those things well. I've, I've never written a resume before. I've written a thousand book reports about Huckleberry Finn, but I haven't ever practiced the skill of how do I talk to somebody who could potentially employ me? How do I make myself look attractive professionally on a piece of paper? How do I do those things? And so the, the fact that this program fills that gap is just so exciting. It's awesome. And it's so just last week, it's, it's interesting to see the students, they get so nervous. And I tell the students, whether it's before your practice interview or your real interview, being nervous is good because mm-hmm. that means you care. Yeah. If you're not nervous, then something's not yeah. right. Be like fuel. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, speaking of, of Western, as long as I'm thinking about it, Career Readiness Center. Yes. Tell me about that. 
Okay, the Career Readiness Center was actually the brainchild of our former career navigator, Megan McCoy. She's now in Florida. And she said, I've been in these other high schools. She was servicing several districts. And she said, I've been in these other high schools and I'm seeing these things. They're called career cafes. And it's hangouts where these kids can go and they can learn about different careers or they might have one-on-one -on -one sessions with college admissions or the military might be in or in their specific intentional spaces. So that grant process started probably about four years ago. And then we had some bumps in the road with COVID and, and location of where it would end up at Western. And then we, we luckily received the grant. SC Johnson helped us with that. And also the, the Bay Area Community Foundation, the youth, the youth Advisory Committee was also part of that grant. And the funds from, the, from that was specifically for furniture. So it's crazy when you realize, wow, this, all this money went to furniture. Mm -hmm. And it's also amazing when you see what a difference furniture makes to students. Mm -hmm. So we, we have a classroom that we're using right now for that space. We've painted it. And it's with the space, it's become so much more intentional of the, the activities that we're doing. And, and I'm constantly thinking of new ideas and how can we use this space? Where w when we didn't have the space, why wasn't I doing that already? I was, but not on the same level. Last week, we had our very first, what I'm calling professional networking session. Mm -hmm. The students, they need some guidance. But we did, we had a couple of the, we had the Local 85 was there, IBW was there, and then Layuna was there, and they came in. And we focused on the skilled trades. And then we had some students come in, and, and my goal is to help them with face-to-face -face conversations. I think Ed can attest that that is something that we are really seeing a struggle with. And I, I don't want to blame the pandemic on everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it definitely hindered our communication skills, and I think even adults. So helping students just, it's easy for them to talk to their peers. It's easy for them to talk to their teachers. But when it's a stranger how do I initiate the conversation? What is the point of even, mm -hmm. even trying to help them understand connections and how that can help you down the road? Beth nailed it. And the kids, they communicate differently with each other. Right. So this is kind of taking them out of their comfort zone where they're not texting or Snapchatting or Instagram. It's, mm -hmm. It is the the face-to-face -face verbal communication. Even just sending emails. The students, they don't really use email to communicate with one another, but that's the way the world works. You mentioned the, the Rotary Vocational Day. Yeah. Talk to me about what that is. Okay, so the, the program is amazing. We haven't had it for a couple years, but what the Rotary Club does is they gather from their members those that want to participate and they call it Vocational Days and they do it once a year. The cool thing for us is that we do set up job shadows one-on-one -on -one basis, but the cool thing for us is this is a large-scale event with all of the Bay County high schools. And so then what happens is they get all of the, the businesses, the industries that want to participate, and they'll, we, we have kind of like a draft between the high schools, oh, and we'll be like, oh, who would like this slot? Who wants this slot? We try not to fight over them. <laughs> <laughs> not, a, not as intense okay. as fantasy football, maybe. <laughs> right. But uh, I think I had a, about 30 students that were able to participate this year. So that's just from one school alone. So if you think about it, if we're getting all the high schools in the community involved on this one day, they're all out there in the community doing a job shadow. And then we all come back together and we have a, have a luncheon or a breakfast, depending on which rotary it was. And we get together and we work on some of those professional networking. We usually have a really awesome guest speaker. This year we had Meg McLeod. She did a great job. It was the best. I mean, I've been, they've been doing this, the Rotary Club of Bay City, the morning and noon combined for this day. They've been doing it for I'd be taking a guess. It's probably been over 30 years. Yeah. So I've been doing it since the time that, that I got this job in 2011. And this past year, I think was the best. It was awesome. It was the best day they've had with Meg yeah. McLeod. Capped it off, and she was just phenomenal. Yeah. Did a great job. The students just absolutely loved it. And like Beth said, all the Bay County high schools, so it's touching over 100 students on one day going job shadow in places like McLaren and Capoco Credit Union and Michigan Sugar. There was, we had a couple doctors, mm -hmm. physical therapy. Chamber had a couple. Yeah, you know, the chamber. Yeah. yeah. I, we, Aubrey, I believe her name was. And yeah. see, even, you remember her name. Mm -hmm. And 
that's cool. That's a connection. That's something that I try to tell the students all the time. Like, so her choosing to, to participate on this day created a connection with you, with yep. Marlena, with who, who else knows, like so many that someday down the road, that might be an opportunity. And I tell the kids all the time, you never know what door might open Amen. when you're making a connection. I mean, when we talk about the practice interviews, I, and I, it's happened where a kid makes an impression on the interviewer and afterwards the interviewer will say, hey, I interviewed so-and-so and, you know, have them get a hold of me if they're looking for a summer job or if they're looking for a work-based oh. learning placement for next year. I mean, that happens often. Oh, I love that. Something we should talk about because you mentioned, and both of you mentioned earlier, so, sometimes kids are interested in a certain position or role or career, but it's not necessarily available um, with with the employers that you currently work work with. So t- talk to me a little bit about that, the employer side of of partnering with with work based learning here in the public schools. How 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 does a, an employer interact with work-based learning? How do they help? What, what do you need them to do? Talk to me a little bit about that. So first, I, I do think that definitely our community, we are starting, we are very heavy career development right now, which I think is awesome. So certain things in just our labor laws, for instance, will prohibit some types of jobs. Mm-hmm. Well, until a student is 18, they aren't going to be able to drive a forklift and, and things like that. But there are ways where companies can figure out a way to find a placement for that student. Um, it's just sometimes it's difficult because they're thinking, Am I, I'm paying this student. Most, most of our placements are paid. You can, you can have unpaid work-based learning, but there's limits on the time. And so that causes issues with our, our course schedules and things like that. But I have had companies that have been really creative with that. Actually, this year, McLaren was going to do a rotation with one of my students, which would have worked for the unpaid, the unpaid one. So you can get creative. But from a company perspective, it, it is, okay, this is going to take some time. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to train this student. But once you get it going, from what most companies have told me, once you get the program going, it's, it's easy. That first year is hard. It's just like the first year of teaching, the first year of doing anything. It's a little bit harder. But, um, and then even help, I know Ed has some things to pay, but even helping to develop those students is something that we, we love to see. And, and there are certain companies that do a great job with it. They'll have growth development goals for the students. And the, the growth you see throughout the year is amazing. I'm going to let Ed pipe in because I know he's got. Yeah. yeah and we, We want to make it as easy as possible for the employers. And we try to tell them this is no different than hiring any other part-time employee. And then Beth and I are on on board to take care of the the other things that you don't normally have to do for a part-time employee. But it's pretty simple. Contacts us and or we contact them and, you know, talk about what they're looking for, what they want a student to do. And then we go over, like Beth mentioned, the, the laws about employing minors. There are things they can't do, drive a forklift, work on a scaffold. They can't drive for their job, so they can't be a delivery driver. They can't even, if one of the part, and we have this happen, is the employer says, well, one thing I want them to do is go to the post office every day and drop mail off or pick mail up, and they can't even do that. Right. So, you know, first we work through, make sure everything is legal, and then we Tell them, hey, we'll send you some applicants. You look at the applicants, and then you go through whatever process you want, whether that's an interview process. And sometimes it's, hey, I've got a home run. You don't need to do anything. But I'm just going to send them. Or the employer will just say, hey, use your judgment. Send me, send me who you think will be the best. And, and we do that too. And some companies will, will have requirements and for qualifications for their job, where other companies will, will say, just like Ed said, send me who you think. But yeah, like with us being the middle, the middle person in this role, it really helps ease some of that hiring process, I think. Like we will schedule the interviews. We will say this student will be showing up at this time. If the, and, and so that helps with that process. Mm. Yeah, I, I love that you guys are kind of, you're acknowledging from the employer perspective that, that, it, that it is a task for them. It, essentially, they're, they're taking on an employee. And that can be complicated when they're younger, and, and it's a little bit different situation than just hiring a straight-up employee. It's a different environment. But I, I also love that you guys are saying, but we are also here to help with that process. It's not just, 
we're going to ship you this student and good luck, everybody. <laughs> right, we, right. We're here. We understand. We know <clears throat> we, we can help you. Th- like how I, I, we we're interested in this, but we're not quite sure how it works. You guys are here to help employers with that. Right. And that's what I always tell every time I make an employer contact that anything you need, I'm at your service. And, you know, this, the one cool thing about Beth and, I, Beth and I's positions are the school district supports this program where we don't have classroom responsibilities. We're oh, full cool. we're full time release work based learning coordinators. So if we need to go to an employer for a half a day, for two hours, where to be mm-hmm. kind of that job coach with the student or, you know, their kids. Issues arise, things happen. Right. So there are times when you we have we get a call, like get there first thing in the morning and the phone rings, hey, this happened yesterday, and we might be there for two or three hours to make th- make sure things work. Yeah, or, right. And the other thing, too, is we're required, as the state requires us, for regular education students, we have to make an in-person visit before the student starts and then every nine weeks thereafter to check mm-hmm. in. So that takes with anywhere from 60 to 100 students in the program, that can take quite a bit of time. So that's something else that we do. So that's even if a student is doing great, doesn't need any assistance, the employer says, hey, everything's great. Love the, love the what's going on here. We still have to. And sometimes it's you're there for literally 30 seconds. Hey, everything good? Yep. Sign the form. Okay. See you later. And <laughs> other times you're there for, for yeah. an hour. Yeah. So. But what, what a gift to have you, have you guys there to be able to help and navigate those situations. It's not just another burden for an employer to handle all by themselves. You've got a team of people saying, nope, we're here to make sure that you're successful as an employer and that these kids are successful Mm -hmm. in their experience. That's one of my favorite parts is like the conflict resolution. A lot of these students, they do struggle with, how do I talk to my supervisor? Yeah, I didn't get this day off and I asked for this day off. Mm -hmm. And and those conversations that we have to have with students, you don't always get the day off that you choose. (laughs) (laughs) But working with the employers and the students, I've had, like Ed said, we've had to go and have meetings and work, communicate, talk things out where kids are learning conflict resolution, which is a skill that they really need right now. uh, Because honestly, I have teenagers. They, Mm. a lot of, (laughs) a lot of kids these days are handling conflict via uh, Snapchat, text message, ghosting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's a different kind of navigation yeah. of that situation. Like you, you might be able to do that well via text, but can you also then stand in front of somebody when they come to you at work and say, "Hey, let's talk about this thing." That's a completely different right, and it's type hard of communication. Yes, it's very oh. difficult. Yeah, most most adults don't even do that well, <laughs> <laughs> right? Let's let's zoom out the the perspective a little bit. When you think of what work-based learning gives to kids, what, what is it? Why is it important? Why is this such a, a, a gift to our community that we have to preserve and, and continue to improve and support in, in any way that we can? What, why is work-based learning important? Ed, I'll ask you first. That's a big question, Phil. I think, and I try not to get too long-winded, I think it's important because it, to build community. One of the things we haven't really talked about yet is a student gets hired in the area in junior, senior in high school. We want to try to keep them here. We've been losing too many students for too long. So that's part of a big part of it is we want to keep them here that they now they have roots here. Now we want them to grow the tree here. So for me, that's, that's what it is, is building community more so than anything. Yeah, I mean, you, you think even just about the, the Rotary Vocational Day, and you have a have hundred kids going to employers in Bay County saying, this is, this is a little snapshot of what life is like to work here in, some, in, in a field that you're somewhat interested in. And you can't really replace that when you talk about how do we keep kids here? How do we keep young people here? It, it, it's considerably easier for them to pack up and leave and go someplace else when they don't have those experiences. But if, if, if we grow, take really intentional steps to grow those roots, giving them positive experiences, fun experiences, meaningful vocational experiences, then when they get to this point of decision, where do I go to school? Where do I want my life to be? We've at least done our due diligence as a community to say, well, we want to make sure that you know what this community can offer you before you make that decision, as opposed to just hoping for the best and saying, well, we've lost another one. 
And honestly, I mean, I think with that, a lot of our students do go away, but there's a lot coming back now. And they, they realize I really like this this small community. I went away and I, I did my thing there, but this is where I want to raise a family. And this is where they, so hopefully if they do get those experiences in high school, they realize that even if they go away and, and experience outside of Bay City, <laughs> that they want to come back. And I know between Ed and I, something that is so cool in terms of the importance of work-based learning is when we see a student um, often that might even come back to that same company so they didn't stay there the whole time, but, you know, they may have left and they went and got their degree or did whatever they needed to do, and then they end up back with that same company. That's really cool. And something that, that I do, I'm not sure if Ed does this, but my seniors have to create a LinkedIn, and I warn them about this as well. I'm like, once you create this, you need to keep it up. Like, it needs to stay, stay current. And so just it is so gratifying to see some of these students on LinkedIn now using it to network and using it to showcase all the cool things they're doing in their industry. And I'm like, wow. And then they'll say, thanks for making me create this, Miss G. Zooming it out even further. So I'm in work-based learning, and let's say that I go over to McLaren or I'm in manufacturing something, but then I end up not in that career. I might even move away. How, how does work-based learning benefit those kids what are what are the additional benefits out of outside of just placement job placement that work based learning can give them well i think just on their resume whether they mm. live in no matter where they're living and you have sc johnson on your resume yep fortune 500 company um you have dow chemical on your resume you have recognizable you have a bank a credit union the, those things they carry weight and employers from wherever they're living see that and I think that their resume, their, their application goes higher in the pile. That's what I sell the kids. Yeah, yeah. Beth, what about you? I agree with that, Ed. I also think something that's really important, and even if it's not through a placement, or maybe it's an outside job, after school job, and something that's not a placement, but getting those workplace skills, the skill set to work with people. I was listening to a podcast the other day that said 85% of your business success comes from your ability to work with people. So, you know, you think about that student that maybe is number one in the class or graduating number one in the class, top of the class, but they don't have those essential skills that we're talking about. And they've spent so much time diving into their studies, which is awesome. I mean, they are going to end up at probably an awesome university, right? But you do need those essential skills, and that's what companies are really saying that they need. So hopefully our students getting out into the workforce in any way, they're getting some of those skills. How do I work with people? How do I handle this situation rather than just quitting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, that, that just quitting is, is kind of what jumped into my brain as you, as you guys were talking was that, that, that putting kids in these situations helps develop a certain kind of resilience. Be, be, uh, how do I handle emotionally when somebody comes to me and they say, hey, this wasn't really what I wanted, or this wasn't as good as I knew, know that you can do it, or hey, we've got a little bit of a conflict. If, if we're not prepared with having experience with those conversations, it can be really easy for us, for us to just kind of quit and go, well, I'm not going to work there, or that's not the place for me. Or, well, no, this was just one conversation that wa was negative and it made you feel a little bit bad, but you, you can move past that. This is still what you want to do. It doesn't spoil the entire experience. And sometimes in working with youth, I've seen that. I know in their heart of hearts, this is what they are called to do, what they should do for the rest of their life. They know that they want it, but they had this little conversation that didn't go their way. And they're just so ready to give up all of a sudden. Oh, this, I, I hate nursing. Well, you don't hate nursing. You just hated this conversation. And that's a skill in and of itself, that kind of grit and resilience to say, I can push past these, these negative experiences because there's a bigger picture here. Ed and I just sent out our evaluations to our partners. And so they do this twice a year. And I actually, I have to encourage employers because they're always worried it's going to impact the student's grade. And so I'll encourage employers, please do not give these students a perfect evaluation. Oh. Please give them areas to grow. One, it helps our students with feedback and constructive criticism and things like that, which is very, very difficult mm -hmm. for this group of students. And I think that that's something that students struggle with is handling feedback when it's not always mm -hmm. 
-hmm. positive. You did amazing. You need a little bit of these are some areas I think you could grow. These are some areas where you you are excelling. Yeah, I think society as a whole not set a lot of these kids up to be successful, like you mentioned in the when something doesn't go your way, just to walk away from it. It's okay to fail. It's okay to you don't go to jail. Are you really in trouble? It's okay to screw up. We've all done dumb things and we've turned out pretty well. And I think the kids in, in kindergarten through 12th grade need to realize that we have most of our kids do not walk into their job and just excel. But it's good that they're just having to deal with these things now where they're not always getting the trophy. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, I think just just kind of the overarching word I'm thinking about with work-based learning is it's preparation. How can we do a better job as a community to help prepare our kids? Hopefully keeping them here, giving them, them roots and giving them experience and giving them different avenues for professional success right here in Bay County, but on a deeper level, on the human level, how can we prepare them for this very critical part of their, the rest of their lives, this professional part of their lives and all the skills that go along with that, essential skills, hard skills, all those things. So if I, first of all, I love what you guys are doing. You are doing amazing work and such important work and work that needs to be intentionally done. It can't, we can't just assume that it'll happen. Well, kids will get summer jobs and it'll just kind of take care of itself. No, we have to be very proactive and it sounds like you guys are doing that. But if somebody is if from the community, a, a potential partner, employer, somebody who's saying, ah, this is something I want to try to help out with, uh, how do they go about that? What are their opportunities for them? How do they reach out to you guys? Well, they can reach out. Should we share our information yes, here please. or will it be? Okay. Yes. So they could reach out to either Ed or myself and, and we can help place students from both schools. We have students that travel. A lot of times people think that we only place students within Bay County. We actually place students in Midland, Saginaw, other, oh, cool. other counties. Yeah. And basically our district is so large geographically. I mean, we have students that live in, in Saginaw. We have students that live in Midland. We have students that live in Pinconning. So, so we, a lot of times we'll say, well, where do you live to try to help them, especially with gas prices right, right. now. Mm -hmm. But students can reach out to, to either of us. My email is jahoskyb, as in boy, at bcschools.net. And you could also just call the school and get that information as well. Yep. Like Beth said, that we work together. So if I get an employer that when Midland calls me, and then I'll refer to Beth and vice versa to geography is a big deal right now with gas prices and, and transportation is one of our biggest hurdles. A lot of students that don't have transportation or don't want to go too far. So Beth and I work together on a lot of that. Um, but to get a hold of us is pretty simple. Beth said email clementse at bcschools.net or they can call 989-402-7712 is my work cell number. And the other thing too that's a little different for Beth and I is the school year, we're off most of June, all of July, and most of August, but Beth and I work pretty much year round. I mean, all summer long, I'm in the office at least a day or two a week, and then with, with the school district, provides both of us with a work cell phone. So if somebody calls June 20th, mm -hmm. I don't say, well, we come back to school August 20th, I'll call you in two months. Right. I, we take care of right. it right then and there, so we're kind of available all the time. Yeah. And if there's an employer, I know we mentioned that we'll start the process February, March for the next school year. But honestly, we will take placements all the way up to the beginning of the school year. So if there is an employer that doesn't make this decision until, let's say, even um, August or very early September, Ed and I can usually still place a student. And I actually had quite a few this year that that's how, how it happened. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Students can start anytime. What we try to do is get them started in like May or June, right when the school year's ending. And then they work most of the summer. And then when the school year starts, then they come back for the school year and then they go to their co-op schedule where they're at school for at least half the day. Some students have three classes, some students have four, some students have five. We have a six period day. And then when they're done with their courses, then they go to work. But we do have placements that come in at the end of August, first couple of weeks of September, and we can usually place right up until about the beginning of October. So, And the bonus for those companies that, that will start the students in May or June is that the former co-ops often will train 
the new co-ops coming in. And so a lot of times those the, the co-ops from the year before, they're going to leave for college in August or whatever, but they have a, some time in there to train the new co-ops. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, be, oh. okay. <laughs> you just sweeten the deal a little bit right there. I love it. So I want to thank you guys for the work that you're doing here for, for the Bay County community and, and specifically our kids here in Bay County. I've been talking with Beth and Ed about work-based learning here in Bay County. I want to thank you guys for coming on the show. Thank you, Phil. It's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so excited. This is my first real podcast. And you crushed it. (laughs) 